Good morning, good evening, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Cult Refresh, your one-stop shop for the very best in movies, music, and more from the past and present. I'm your host, Jacob Kelta, a filmmaker, writer, and composer with a love of fine art and entertainment, here to guide you on a journey through three fine works worth your time and attention. This week, it's explosive excitement on the high seas as the British Navy tangos with the world's most infamous battleship in the heat of the Second World War in the 1960 naval drama, Sink the Bismarck. The Queen of Soul is back in town with one of her all-time classic albums that birthed fan favorites and a wall-to-wall collection of masterclasses in infectious songcraft. From 1968 on the Atlantic label, it's Lady Soul. And lastly, an independent comic with a lot of bite and a wicked tough Genesis game behind it. Immortality is the cruelest curse for one man whose quick hand and undying quest to slay all evil in the world has come to a head in Shikan the Forever Man. All that and more on this week's installment of The Cult Refresh. I'm Ed Murrow. The time was May 1941. Britain stood alone. Convoy sinkings were increasing. When Bismarck, the most powerful battleship in the world, broke out into the Atlantic and sank the hood. Bismarck had to be sunk if Britain was to survive. Winston Churchill gave the order. I don't care how you do it. You must sink the Bismarck. This is how it was done. The Moby Dick of the Royal Navy and one of the greatest stories in the turbulent history of the Second World War. The Bismarck class were, at the time, the largest battleships in the history of both the German Navy and in all of Europe, full stop. And the class namesake, the Bismarck, was the star antagonist in one of the most infamous sea chases in the annals of history. Such a gripping tale was destined for the silver screen, and in 1960, made landfall in director Lewis Gilbert's Sink the Bismarck. Adapted from C.S. Foster's novel The Last Nine Days of the Bismarck, this black-and-white cinemascope production dramatized the hunt for the German behemoth. Captain Jonathan Shepard, played by Kenneth Moore, works to locate and coordinate the defeat of the Bismarck to stave off the worst of the damage it can cause, though the price to pay will be exceptionally high. The film manages to take on the character of an epic within its 97-minute runtime, bouncing back and forth between the travails of Captain Shepard and his staff, including the lovely Dana Winter, as Second Officer Ann Davis, the brave men of the Royal Navy across the many ships seen in the film, and the leadership and crew of the Bismarck himself. The many tangled narratives of the hunt itself and the lives of those involved make for an incredibly engaging drama that keeps the audience invested even without the action with Moore's ice-cold take on Shepard proving to be part of a complex characterization of a man shattered by loss. My son's missing. His plane ran out of fuel, failed to return. Terribly sorry, sir. There's a good chance he'll be picked up. He will be picked up. When I got out of hospital, all I could think about was getting back to London. I wanted to see my wife. I took a taxi from Waterloo as I drove into Welbeck Place. Everything looked so familiar. Every house was just as I remembered it. Every house except mine. There was a large black hole in the ground where my house had been. (laughs) Where my wife had been. I didn't think it was possible to feel such pain. I know. I've been through it myself, and I know. I swore that night I'd never again get emotionally attached to a human being as long as I'd lived. But I made one mistake. I forgot about... I forgot about my son. But even without a stacked cast of talent to carry the film through, the sheer spectacle of the battle sequences is a sight to behold. 
with enough scale to the models and incredibly coordinated staging to result in sequences whose realism borders on uncanny and arguably stands to some of the best in miniature effects over a half century on. Armed with faithful production design, stylish cinematography, and a taut sense of pacing on director Gilbert's part, not even the often dry-as-a-desert English quality of the picture can dissuade wider audiences from getting invested in seeing the cat-and-mouse game with the Bismarck through. A war film as exciting as it is human, Sink the Bismarck stance is a classic depiction of a legendary chapter of World War II history. Available on home video and floating around YouTube. And by then, I mean, Ian Holland was just quite unique, I think. I mean, someone brought him from America. And, uh, well, you know, gave him a real good kick. But three years ago, it wasn't that swinging for you, was it? So. No, no. What was the... All of this has happened in the last year. Yeah, and how, I mean, what was the break, actually? Where... Atlantic Records, I think. There are singers, there are talents, and then there are goddesses. Aretha Franklin was and is one of America's musical goddesses, with a career that spanned over six decades, and a voice that stood as both instantly identifiable and as a powerful sound that resonated across all genres and styles. When Franklin made the move to Atlantic Records, her star shot right through the sky on the back of her classic 1967 LP, I Never Loved a Man the Way I Love You, sporting her world-famous take on Otis Redding's Respect that would become the Queen of Souls signature tune. Once 1968 rolled around, and after her 11th record, Aretha Arrives, had come and gone, the singer-songwriter's third on the label would prove the true successor to her breakthrough. Lady Soul is a red-hot platter, 30 minutes of fine-tuned soul with crisp production from Jerry Wexler, and one of the most electric performances from Franklin in her career to that point, and in some ways remains unmatched. The album has an eye for the rock market with mega hits like Chain of Fools and the increased presence of electric guitars across the album met with seductive vocal lines and wicked tight horns, drums, and the infectious backing vocals of the sweet inspirations in their second outing with Franklin. This is compounded by blues track Good To Me As I Am To You sporting lead guitar from none other than guitar god Eric Clapton, who is still on top of the world and the charts with the rock band Cream. But above all else, the southern soul side of the record shines through to deliver some of the grooviest tracks and most sensational tunes of the album, including the jaw-droppingly catchy Nicky Hookie, easily the album standout. Match with down-tempo fare like the gospel of the Curtis Mayfield pen, People Get Ready, and the next major number in Franklin's personal standards catalog, the colossal ballad, You Make Me Feel Like a Natural Woman, the record is wall-to-wall -wall sensational soul without a dud in the running order. No weak spots, no filler, and not a sour note to be had. Widely available on both physical and digital, Lady Soul is a rocking, funky, seductive LP. It simply is Aretha Franklin in her prime. Long live the queen. Now for a quick trip to the gallery, our humble little way of honoring some of our favorite works of fine art.
If you wish to support me and my work, consider checking out my music on Bandcamp or diving headlong into the world of my sci-fi pulp fiction series 365 Infantry. The stories and songs I enjoy sharing here inspire my work in many ways, so chances are if you dig what I highlight here, you'll enjoy my own spin on things. Now back to the show. He is many things, the Grey Slayer, Death's Warrior, a prince whose hubris, backed by skill, netted him an eternity of suffering with only one way to truly end it all, vanquish all evil in the world. He is Shakan, the Forever Man. The brainchild of indie comic artist Robert A. Krause, Shakan is best remembered as the star of the brutal 1992 action platformer for the Sega Genesis and Game Gear, produced by Echo the Dolphin creator Ed Annunziata, a game whose grim beauty is matched with sheer beat-your-brains-out difficulty with many a bold and surprising twist awaiting players upon the game's completion. But the character takes on an entirely different appeal when in the pages of this one-shot from Krause's own company Rack Graphics, a book diving into Shakan's final battle with the evil beasts of the world and the promise of his release from death's deceptive bet close at hand. While creator Krauss described Shakan as a zombie Clint Eastwood, the character's combination of Iron Maiden's Eddie and Robert E. Howard's Solomon Kane is a terrifically imaginative image that is brought to life in incredible black and white art that blends a bevy of styles and techniques to bring the dark fantasy world of Shakan to life. Some might not be enchanted by the simple story or the changing styles, and the text boxes can get remarkably wordy at times, but the story itself is quite a compelling one and the rough around the edges art makes for a gritty underground experience. This reader was blasting Black Sabbath's immortal Headless Cross album throughout the proceedings, which definitely set the mood, especially when the final strains of doom metal masterpiece When Death Calls were ringing out over the jaw-dropping ending. In the world of underground comics, Shakan No. 1 is well worth a look as a grim fantasy cult favorite with an exceptional sense of style riding atop a gloriously darksome premise. The collector's market hasn't totally gobbled this one up, so hunt down secondhand copies at your leisure and join Shikan in this underrated comic. And now for today's Top Shelf Talents, the part of the show where we dig into the latest and greatest in the world of independent art and entertainment. First up, Furio by Cat Temper. Veteran synthwave stud Mike Langley's Cat Temper project has been scratching the itch for feline-themed retro-electronica for ages now, and is back on the block once more with a perfect little LP, Furio. Taking aim at the glossier side of New Wave, Electro, and Italo Disco, Furio manages to stick the landing on all fours and deliver a cohesive and smooth album, with track after track of synthy goodness. Out now on Bandcamp. Second up is the campaign for Kitsun Chia's latest cyberpunk affair, Babylon Black. The third in the Singaporean Pulp Maestro series revolving around the never-ending fight against the demons who rule under the guise of gods in the city of Nova Babylonia, the third collection promises a quartet of never-before-seen tales that cover the final days of the city ravaged by the unorthodox war. Fundraising is currently happening now on Indiegogo and will end on April 8th. Campaign supporters will also be treated to special deals from independent publisher Tuscany Bay Books and a few treats from the world of 365 Infantry. Redgar gazed out across the desert sands. Cold blue eyes narrowed against the harsh light, and blonde hair hung in limp tangles. The Hathor balanced his giant sword on one massive shoulder. His pale skin had turned pink under the hateful eye of the sun, and the unrelenting heat baked the sweat off his skin before it could form. His lips were cracked and blistered, but his eyes had lost none of their steely determination. He said, 
And lastly, a blanket recommendation of Savage Realms Monthly. This unique send-up to classic sword and sorcery fiction has taken up the mantle of indie publication in a way few others have, by promising a monthly release schedule and slowly growing library of issues in print, digital, and courtesy of the terrific narrator Moose Matson, audiobooks. If you're looking for a regular stream of unpretentious send-ups to the likes of Robert E. Howard, Michael Moorcock, and Carl Edward Wagner, Savage Realms will keep your sword sharpened and your imagination eternally sparked. And that just about wraps it up. If you love what we do here on Quality Candor, don't forget to subscribe on YouTube, Dailymotion, Rumble, and BitChute. And follow us on Twitter at Candor Quality to keep up to date on the latest in the refresh and other exciting documentaries. Catch you on the flip side. <laughs>